All right, so as we can see, there is no Jan yet around. So uh, we have a recording for everyone who's joining late. So they will know what happened at the beginning of the class. Um, what's happening at the beginning of the class? I have no idea. And this is I just woke up and I figure out that Jan is not yet here. So, you know, interesting. I was saying that this semester, this yeah, semester, I was actually thinking to mostly uh, Re, re teach the things from last semester, but then halfway through, oh, no, I cannot because things changed. Uh, I changed the way I see things. Actually, think the things are still the same, right? But uh, since we taught the uh, energy based model, uh, latent variable energy based model at the beginning, right, of the, of the semester in the first part, then now you have a additional tool to understand other topics and, and uh, other subjects. And then I actually need to use that tool because you already know that, right? I cannot pretend it doesn't exist. And so I think I've been doing a reasonably good job, perhaps I, you, you judge, uh, in uh, reproposing the kind of same topics as last year, but in a new uh, light, uh, which was rather uh, interesting and like, uh, uh, new for me, at least, like I didn't necessarily know this last year, right? Or well, last semester. So then also we had the homework, right? On the uh, energy based models, uh, thanks to Vlad, which should have given you a understanding of how minimizing a energy or something like, uh, like doing gradient descent can also be considered uh, inference or is considered in inference, right? And that actually was a, a proper case, right? So you find the uh, value in that case, if you do the arc mean, you find the minimum path, right? The Viterbi one. Um, if you don't do the minimum, but you do the, uh, the soft minimum, right? You're going to get the forward algorithm. The one we saw in trans in a uh, speech recognition, uh, what else? Oh yeah. And then last class we, we saw that, uh, the control part, right? The optimal control is nothing but uh, energy minimization, right? With respect to the latent and the latent is actually the control. So all these things, uh, you know, took years, maybe <laughs> let's say years for me, uh, to understand clearly and then deeply. Uh, but now you don't need years, right? Because since you already know how this energy based model work then everything else is just, you know, a, it works because the other work, right? So you can see everything from the same perspective. Nothing is, should be surprised you too much. Okay. Because it's all the same stuff over again. I, if I knew in advance, no, that I was going to be talking, I was going to prepare something, but, uh, I can improvise. I don't have a piano here, so no, no music for you. Uh, what else can we do? Uh, I don't know, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> 15 minutes later we are kind of 15 minutes through the class and Jan is not answering I have no idea <laughs> is he coming to class hello <laughs> oh good morning hello everyone hi we were worried that you are not gonna be coming anymore sorry I had a number of different problems <laughs> okay I uh, hope you fixed them yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, there are updated slides on the website. Okay. Um, so you want to turn on your space car space? Yeah, it's going to take a while. I'm not sure why, but I'm having issues with. Okay. Okay, I can replace it in a post editing. No, you don't want to do this. Um, it's just that I'm going to freeze for a few for a few seconds. Okay. Um, all right, we're going to talk about uh, optimization today. Um, about. Um, uh, you know, a little bit of the theory and the practice, you know, you've, you've played with uh, various optimization schemes. And, um, okay, here we go. We have a background. Uh, you've used them uh, a lot, but the, the question is, uh, you know, can we, can we explain why all those tricks, uh, you know, wh where, where do they come from? essentially. All right, so optimization for deep learning. Um, I should tell you right now that uh, I borrowed a lot of material from Aaron DeFazio. So Aaron DeFazio is a, a specialist of uh, optimization who works at, at Facebook AI Research. He gave a guest lecture in this course uh, last year and uh, his lecture was very really good. And uh, so I borrowed a lot of material from it. 
um, and uh, uh, and some other things as well. Okay, so let's jump in. Okay, we all know about gradient descent, right? So gradient descent uh, in in the context of machine learning, uh, we have a loss function which uh, generally is an average over uh, individual per sample losses that uh, take individual samples, x, i, y, i, uh, as well as a parameter. And we're gonna just uh, denote the objective function we're minimizing just f of uh, w, w being the parameter vector or parameter object, whatever it is, um, that uh, uh, we're going to optimize uh, there. So we're kind of hiding you know, all the data sets sort of inside of this, uh, of, uh, of this f. And gradient descent, of course, as you know, is uh, an update formula where we compute the, the new parameter value at iteration k plus one uh, by uh, additive update of the old parameter value. And the update is proportional to the gradient or the negative gradient rather uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the function at, at the location. Uh, the gradient is uh, when you write it as a partial derivative uh, as we've seen, is a row vector. So here I, I've written it as the transpose. Um, I haven't been very systematic about this in the notations later, but um, that's kind of the that's kind of the idea. Um, and then you have this running rate here. So the running rates you've been playing with uh, so far were scalar positive values that you would decrease over time, and you would actually use stochastic gradient, not full gradient. And so the 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 gradient that you computed here was not the gradient of this uh, average function, but was an estimate of this function on the basis of a small number of samples, perhaps even a single sample or a mini batch. Okay, and that's called stochastic gradient, of course, as you know. Now, uh, what we're gonna see is that there are various methods in which this learning rate can be a diagonal matrix, which means you have a separate learning rate for each weight, right? When we multiply a diagonal matrix by, uh, by a, a column vector, you get you kind of scale each component by uh, uh, by some coefficient, or it could be a full matrix, or it could be a low rank matrix. So there's various methods, which I'm, and I'm not going to go into all of those methods uh, because most of them are completely irrelevant to machine learning, actually, or at least to uh, parameter update for machine learning. They can be relevant to inference, but not for for parameter updates. Um, and the reason why they're not so relevant, even though you know the, most of the literature in optimization actually concerns those methods, where uh, you know gradient-based method, when the, the the learning rate basically is a, is a full matrix, uh, we don't use them very much in machine learning because uh, if we have 100 million parameters, this matrix would be 100 million by 100 million, and that's kind of imp impractical. Um, so there's been a lot of attempts to try to kind of Use the advantages of those of those me methods, but uh, in the end, nobody use use them. We we all know that uh, setting the learning rate is uh, is kind of a bit of an art, and uh, you know th there's there's a way uh, that you can analyze this theoretically, uh, certainly in a one-dimensional quadratic case, but also in a multi-dimensional quadratic case, and then extend this to the multi-dimensional non-quadratic case. So, in the quadratic case, one dimension, uh, if you set the learning rate to a small value. You know the the uh, the parameter will sort of slowly progress towards the minimum, uh, and it's it's going to be what to uh, anyone who is reasonable uh, would think of as an exponential convergence, exponential in the sense that the distance between the weight uh, value, the parameter value, the the, the scalar uh, weight value, and the optimal uh, value. Uh, is, is multiplied by a constant that is less than one at every time step, okay? So in that sense, it's exponential. But in optimization term, if you read the optimization literature, that's called linear convergence. Uh, it's called linear convergence because the number of, uh, because they work in log space. So the number of significant digits uh, that kind of uh, are added to the solution at every time step increases linearly, okay? And for most people who are specialists of optimization, that's bad, that's slow. What you want is something like superlinear or quadratic convergence. Uh, unfortunately, that's basically unattainable in, uh, in, in machine learning because of the size of the, of, the, of the networks that we have, the number of parameters and the size of the objective function. So we have to resort to simpler methods like uh, stochastic gradients and, it, and its variants. But that doesn't mean that we can't uh, accelerate the training and that's basically the, the focus of this lecture. 
Now, so in 1D uh, quadratic case, if you, um, uh, in, there, is, there is going to be a value of the learning rate that is optimal that is going to make you jump directly to the minimum in one step. Okay, and we'll, we'll see what value that is. Um, uh, it's, called the, it's called Newton's algorithm, actually, if you, if you do this, if you compute this optimal learning rate. If you increase the learning rate beyond that uh, optimal value in one dimension, the system starts oscillating, but it still converges. And then if the learning rate is more than twice the optimal value, then it diverges, okay? So the situation in multi-dimension is uh, considerably more complicated because in multiple dimensions, the, 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 the convergence uh, speed here and the optimal learning rate depends on the curvature of the, the second derivative of the function. And in multiple dimensions, you might have different second derivatives in different dimensions. That's what makes things complicated. So in fact, here is, uh, um, here is an example of this. Uh, so we, we, here we have a two-dimensional uh, objective function. And uh, at, um, so here uh, on, the, on the right, I'm, um, I plotted the lines of uh, equal cost, okay? The, uh, and the gradient vector points upwards, okay? So we have a minimum here in the center. Uh, this is a quadratic function, so it kind of, you know, it's a ball, quadratic ball. It's got different curvatures in, in, in those two directions, okay? Those are called the, uh, so this axis here, which is uh, the main axis of those ellipse, ellipses, um, uh, is, is, um, is, is, is called one of the principal dimensions, in fact, of that, um, of that objective function. And, uh, you know, the orthogonal value is, is another one. Uh, those are related to um, eigenvectors of the Hessian, we'll talk about this later. Um, and the gradient uh, vector at every point is uh, a gradient that points upwards and is orthogonal to the lines of equal cost, okay? Now, if you have an algorithm that uh, uh, uses an update and that update has a negative, strictly negative dot product with the gradient, it's going, it's going to get closer to the minimum, right? So any gradient-based method or any, any descent method actually, um, in a, a continuous convex case, that um, where the descent direction has a negative dot product with a gradient is going to take, eventually to take you down to the minimum, all right? Uh, it doesn't have to be the gradient. So the gradient itself, which is, uh, I mean, the, the best, you know, the descent direction is the negative gradient, right? So if you take the negative of the gradient, you're gonna to point towards the minimum, but this is not the best direction necessarily because as you can see in this example here, the negative gradient doesn't actually point towards the minimum. It points kind of a little off to the side. Um, so in fact, there may be a, a better direction that actually points directly to the minimum. Unfortunately, that direction is very hard to compute. It involves inverting a huge matrix whose size is the square of the, uh, the size of the number of parameters. Uh, again, that's Newton's algorithm. We'll come back to this. Um, all right, so uh, here are two examples. This is, uh, these are non-quadratic functions. Actually, on the left, it is. Uh, if you have a small enough running rate, the trajectory that's gonna be followed is going to first converge in the direction where the curvature is large. So here you see the ellipses are elongated in one direction. In, in the elongated direction, the, the curvature is, is low. And then the narrow direction, the curvature is large, right? Um, and what you see here in the dynamics of convergence is that the the, the, the direction, along the direction of high curvature, the, the convergence is faster than along the direction of low curvature, okay? Now, the, if you increase the learning rate a little bit, you, you can get the situation here on the left where in the direction of high curvature, things start to oscillate, still converge, but it oscillates. Whereas in the direction of, of low curvature, you know, it converges slowly, okay? so. Here is, a, here is the main problem that we're gonna have to face, which is that in a high dimensional uh, space, like uh, the space of the cost function of a neural net, we're gonna have some dimensions in, in which the curvature is gonna be large and some dimensions in which the direction, in which the curvature is gonna be small. The speed of convergence is determined by the, the slowness of the convergence in the direction where the curvature is small, okay? but the maximum learning rate, so we could crank up the learning rate, but we can't crank up the learning rate too much because below a certain point, the, uh, our system is gonna start diverging in the directions where the curvature is large. Okay, so basically, uh, 
the convergence speed is limited because we can't increase the learning rate uh, too much that's determined by the largest curvature. And then once we have that learning rate, the, the running speed, the, the time of uh, a convergence is basically determined by the direction of lowest curvature. Uh, there are directions where the curvature is flat. We don't care about those, but there are you know, directions where the curvature is not very large and it's gonna take a long time to uh, converge in those directions. The ratio of the largest curvature to the smallest curvature is called the condition number. And basically uh, that, um, uh, that determines um, you know, how efficiently you can uh, optimize uh, a function with uh, gradient descent, including stochastic gradient. Now there's a second issue, of course, uh, which is the fact that the functions we optimize in, uh, in machine learning are non-convex. Um, so uh, a lot has been written and said about the, the fact that the, the objective function is non-convex. This makes a lot of uh, theorists very uneasy uh, and in fact, one of the reasons why uh, neural nets were, you know, basically not well appreciated uh, in, uh, in machine learning for a long time uh, is because the, the objective function is non-convex. And if you're a theoretician, if you're an academic, you want to prove things, you can't prove anything, essentially. And so you cannot prove the convergence of uh, gradient-based uh, learning in, in multilayer neural nets. Uh, you cannot prove that uh, your optimization is not going to get stuck in a local minimum. But empirically, we know for a fact that it's pretty rare in sort of, you know, the, the typical architectures that we use with the proper tricks, it's very rare that we get stuck in local minima. It's very consistent that when you train a neural net with the, you know, appropriate black heart that goes behind that, that is implemented in, in PyTorch and other frameworks, um, Training is pretty reliable. You pretty much get the same result every time. You don't get the same parameter value. That depends on the initialization a lot, but and and on the random uh, choice of uh, training samples. But you get pretty much the same uh, loss, uh, final loss uh, every time. Okay. Uh, now there's been some studies that tend to show that the number of isolated regions uh, uh, that the uh, gradient-based algorithm will converge when it's uh, a neural net when you're training a neural net. Is very small. So essentially, uh, you know, the most of the minima are, despite the fact that they are local, are connected. You can go from one minimum to another uh, without having to go up a hill. Essentially, they are mostly connected. They're not all completely connected. Okay, but the, there is there's a lot of uh, degeneracy in the minimum. This is particularly true in a very large neural net. So. Uh, Neural nets that we use very often are way over, uh, oversized, over-parameterized for the problems that we want to solve. And in fact, we can, we can see this uh, by, because when we train a neural net, we can generally get to zero, zero error on the training set, right? And that's because the neural nets we train are much larger than necessary to learn the function. And so it completely nails the objective function, finds a, a minimum that's really close to zero. Um, if it's at all possible, of course, it may not be possible. But, um, and why, why do we do this? Um, we do this because it causes the objective function to be highly degenerate, which means um, there are many dimensions that you can move when you are at a minimum. You can move in many, many different directions without actually changing the objective function at all, okay? There's only a small number of dimensions, not that small, but small number of dimensions where you change the parameters, you change the weight, the, the loss will increase. In many dimensions, it will just not change. Okay, so imagine a, imagine a neural net, okay, where uh, multiple multiple layers. There is a unit in it, which has a whole bunch of weights coming into this unit, and imagine that all the weights coming out of this unit are zero. Okay, so essentially, no one sees that that unit in the rest of the network. You can change the weights of that unit; it will have zero effect whatsoever, no effect whatsoever on the on the loss. Um, and these things happen a lot. Um, imagine that you have two inputs that are highly correlated or let's say equal up to a, a constant factor. Um, you may have two separate weights connecting to those two inputs, but since those two inputs are essentially equal, it doesn't matter what the individual weight values are. The only thing that matters is the sum of the two weights, okay? 
because the sum of those weights will determine the importance of that feature, which is replicated uh, twice, which means there is a direction in weight space where you can you know, change the, the first weight by a little and change the other weight by a little in the other direction. You don't change the sum. You don't change the overall function of the system. Uh, uh, yet, um, you've changed weights, right? So that's one direction where you, you can change weight and it makes no difference to the output. Um, so in an overparameterized neural net, you have lots of dimensions like this, where uh, essentially it doesn't matter um, what changes you um, you 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 make. Um, right. So of course, uh, you know, in practice, we all use stochastic gradient, and and as you know, stochastic gradient consists in uh, evaluating the gradient on the basis of a small number of samples or even a single sample. Uh, people don't like. Uh, there's some people in optimization who don't like the, the, the word stochastic gradient descent, SGD, because it's not a descent algorithm. Sometimes you go uphill because the gradient is so noisy. Uh, so, other, so some people have advocated the name stochastic gradient optimization, but not stochastic gradient descent because it's not descent. But you know the phrase is, is caught, so it's called SGD. Um, and on average, SGD behaves like, uh, like gradient descent. Um, uh, if you really want to learn everything about SGD and about stochastic optimization methods, uh, I recommend this uh, this paper by uh, uh, Leon Boutou, who is uh, a colleague at Facebook, uh, Jorge Nocedal, who is a very famous uh, person in optimization, um, and and uh, their, their colleague uh, Curtis. And, and this is a very long paper, 75 pages, which has the entire theory of why SGD converges. It turns out to be surprisingly difficult to prove theoretically that SGD converges. Uh, you can prove it very simply in um, in, in very simple cases, but uh, for least square, for a quadratic function with independent variables, this was proven in the 1950s. But uh, it was it used to be called stochastic approximation. But um, but in a general uh, sense, and then can you accelerate it? Uh, you know, can you use second order methods with uh, by estimating the curvature? If you want to know everything about this, this is the paper. Um, uh, you know, you need some time ahead of you to digest all of this. Um, so the trajectory followed by HDD is kind of erratic, but it's faster in the context of uh, machine learning. And we'll see uh, why in a minute. OK, uh, so let's analyze the convergence of, uh, of gradient descent. Right. So uh, our function, again, is, uh, is an average of uh, per sample loss functions. Uh, we're just going to call it f of w. And full gradient. Is, uh, is this uh, method wk plus one equals wk minus uh, step size, running rate, uh, times the gradient of the function with respect to w. And if I, if I were completely uh, correct here, I would have had to write a transpose on this gradient, OK? Uh, if you denote as the partial derivative, you have to transpose it. Or you can write it as the nab with the, the nabla uh, symbol, and then it's already transposed. Um, OK, uh, so what we're going to show over the next few slides is that the optimal learning rate uh, in one dimension is equal to the inverse of the second derivative of the objective. And then we're going to generalize this to multiple dimensions. OK. Um, so, uh, so here is a little diagram that I showed earlier. Um, and we are looking for the optimal value of the learning rate here. And we want to arrive at this, res re this result that uh, the optimal learning rate is the uh, inverse of the second derivative. OK, so here's a little diagram here on the right, which is a little complicated. I'm going to spend a bit of time on this. But, um, but in the end, uh, it doesn't appeal to any particularly complex concept. OK, so let's say we have a quadratic uh, objective function like this. We are, we are at location WK. OK, uh, and we're going to take one step. This is going to take us to. Uh, location wk plus one, and we'd like this wk plus one to be at the minimum of the function. Okay, so what is the running rate that will take us to that minimum? Okay, so this is our objective function, uh, f of w, and this is f of wk right here. Okay, um, and then I'm going to plot here. What I plotted at the bottom is the the derivative of that function. So because this is a quadratic function, the derivative is a is a line, right? The derivative of a second degree polynomial is is a linear is linear, right? Um, so the the value uh, of of that uh, 
linear function is the is the gradient, okay? And the slope, which is the derivative of the derivative, is the second derivative, right? So the slope of that curve is the second derivative of our original objective function, right? That's the function, that's the derivative, the derivative of that derivative is the second derivative, and that's the slope of that, of that line. Okay, now there's an interesting relationship here, which is indicated by those, uh, those, three, uh, uh, those three formulas. So we are at WK, we take a step towards WK plus one. So this distance here is WK plus one minus WK, right? Now, when we're making this step, uh, because the slope here is the second derivative, the increment of the derivative, okay, the difference between the derivative at wk plus one and the derivative at wk is this distance, right? And because we know the slope, we know that if we take this, this distance multiplied by the slope, we get that, right? And that's the formula that we have here. Um, I wrote it as if it were multidimensional. We are in the scalar case here on the diagram. But in fact, that relationship is actually true also in multidimension. So imagine W is a vector. Uh, you turn it into a row vector here so that you can pre-multiply by this thing, which actually ends up being a matrix. It's called a Hessian matrix. I'll come back to this. Okay, but let's just think about the one-dimensional case for now. And this is the difference between the derivatives or the gradients at WK plus one and WK, right? So this is an important formula because it, it tells you basically, uh, you know, the relationship between, between the second derivative, the difference of two gradients, and the increment. And this is basically the main thing you need to know about optimization, okay, about random based optimization. Um, all right, so now we want to solve this for uh, W uh, 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 so that um, the gradient at, at WK plus one is zero, okay? Uh, so I've rewritten the, the, the formula here. I've rewritten by just transposing everything, right? So this is a transpose of the second derivative matrix. So in fact, you don't need to transpose the second derivative matrix because it's actually symmetric, okay? The matrix of second derivatives is symmetric. And again, I'll come back to exactly to what that means, this matrix of second derivatives. Um, so this matrix of second derivative called the Hessian matrix, which doesn't need this transpose, multiplied by the difference between where you are and where you want to be, or where you were and where you are now, is equal to the difference of the gradients. Gradient where you are with respect to gradient where you're going to be. Okay, so we want to jump directly to the minimum. At the minimum, which would be, uh, so our next step would be at WK plus one. At that minimum, we want the gradient to be zero, right? So we're going to set this to zero. Okay, and then uh, we are left with this equation, essentially. Okay, so now this is the, the symbol that we use for the minimum, W check. Okay, it's the value of W that minimizes the loss. Uh, and I've just rewritten this equation where I set this to zero. Okay, so W check minus WK, pre-multiplied by the Hessian matrix, the second derivative uh, is equal to minus the gradient. Okay, that's the term that's left here. Again, that's basically the main formula you need to know about optimization, about gradient-based optimization. Uh, all the methods uh, that people have, have derived are kind of um, derived by this, okay? Now, here is the thing. In one dimension, that's easy to do. Um, you, just, you, just, uh, you just do this, right? W check equals WK minus uh, the inverse of the second derivative times the gradient. Uh, and if you identify this with the uh, update formula for gradient, uh, this plays the role of the learning rate, right? This is like a, a gradient update formula where the learning rate has been uh, replaced by the inverse of the second derivative. Okay, so you conclude, if I want to jump directly to the minimum, I just need to uh, set the uh, learning rate to the inverse of the second derivative. And that will make me jump to the minimum in one dimension, okay? In multiple dimension, it will just make me jump to the minimum in the direction of largest curvature if I can figure out what is the largest uh, direction of curvature. But it's not, it's not going to make me converge uh, 
fast in the other direction. So I'm going to have to wait for those to converge. Okay, so this only works for one dimension. Um, now in multiple dimension, this still actually works. Okay, so you, you can set the learning rate to the inverse uh, second derivative uh, uh, because, um, because of the reason I just explained. But in fact, those formulas still work in the sense that now this is a matrix, okay? And what you need to compute here is the inverse of this, of this matrix. You don't actually do it this way. Uh, if you want to do it, you solve that linear system, okay? This is a linear system where the unknown is W check. Uh, and you basically solve this linear system as a function of W check, where uh, this matrix is the matrix of coefficients. And, and this is the, you know, this is like uh, AX plus B uh, and, and that's the unknown. So there is a question here. What if yes. the, uh, that matrix doesn't allow an inverse? Yeah, um, <laughs> we'll talk about this. <laughs> uh, most of the time, okay, there are two issues. Okay, this is for the quadratic case, and this is for the positive definite case where the Hessian matrix uh, is, um, is invertible, which means uh, you know, it doesn't have uh, zero uh, eigenvalues, and it certainly doesn't have negative eigenvalues because then the function would not be convex, okay? Um, so we're assuming that in all directions, the the, uh, uh, the loss function curls up, which of course is not true in the case of neural nets. As I said, many directions are flat, okay? So we cannot even do this with neural nets. We can't invert that, that uh, Hessian matrix. But let me explain a little bit what the Hessian matrix actually, actually is. So I have, um, I have a, a scalar function, okay, which takes a, a, a parameter. So this is my function f and it produces a scalar, right? F of W, that's my, that's my loss function. Uh, but W is, uh, is a vector. So um, uh, DF over DW, of course, is a vector whose dimension is the same as W, okay? Dimension N, let's call this N. Uh, and, and the second, the, the, the Hessian matrix, is denoted this way, is an n by n matrix. Okay, so this matrix, the, the term uh, ij, in this matrix, is the second derivative of the function, so this is at a particular point W, right? At that point W, and you differentiate first with respect to uh, WI and then with respect to WJ, or the other way around, but it doesn't matter because it's symmetric, okay? So this is really, you can write this this way, D over uh, DW uh, I, let's say, of df over dwj. Okay, and it's equal to d over dwj of df over dwi. Okay, so this is the gradient. This is a vector. Okay, uh, and this whole thing here is the is the derivative of a vector with respect to a vector of the same size. Okay, so df over dw. Is, uh, is a function that takes uh, w, so df over dw, and produces a vector, okay? And the input has n dimension, the output has n dimension. The derivative of that function uh, is a matrix, it has to be a matrix, because for every input and every output, there's going to be a derivative, a scalar derivative that indicates how this output is influenced by this input. If you wiggle this input by delta, the output will wiggle by D2F, uh, uh, I mean, by, by this term, right? So if I, if I wiggle the input WI here of, of, this, uh, of this gradient function by delta, uh, 
the jth output, the output number j, is going to wiggle by, by this times the delta. OK? Because it's the derivative, it's a partial derivative of the output number j with respect to input number i. Um, so that's what the Hessian matrix is. Uh, and it's it's a matrix where you have df d2f over dw1 dw1. Um, so you have the diagonal terms, and you know the ij term. is uh, D2F with respect to DWI, DWJ. Okay, that's the Hessian matrix. Okay, now what are the properties of this Hessian matrix? So if I take a quadratic function, and it's a quadratic function that um, is in two dimension, okay? So this is W1 and W2. And my function is elongated, which means the curvature in this direction is smaller than the curvature in that direction, right? In other words, uh, D2F over DW1 squared, so DW1, DW1, right? Um, is something, let's say two, okay? Take a random example. And then D2F over DW2 uh, squared is one or something like this, right? So the curvature in W1 is twice the curvature as in uh, W2. What is the Hessian matrix? Um, so in this particular case, the Hessian matrix is, um, so basically this, this quadratic function could be written, uh, I've, I've put the minimum at zero, um, I could shift it, it would be easy, but um, essentially I can write it as um, uh, two times W1 squared plus one times W2 squared. And I think I need to divide this by two. Okay, so this is my function f of w, right? If I if I differentiate with respect to w one, uh, this term goes away. Uh, this guy becomes uh, uh, so the the two from the derivative cancel, so I get two w one. Okay, and if I differentiate again. I get two. Okay. And same for W2. I would get one, right, for the second derivative. Um, now, if I uh, if I try to compute uh, df d2f over dw1 dw2. Okay, for this for this particular um, this particular simple function here. Um, so I first differentiate with respect to W1. Um, so I'm going to get um, 2 W1. And I now differentiate this with respect to W2. So this is D over DW2 of 2 W1. And if you differentiate this with respect to W2, I get zero, right? Because I don't have W2s anymore. Um, so the resulting, the result is that this Hessian matrix now, I can write it down. Uh, it's uh, it's two, one, zero, zero. Okay, it has no off diagonal terms. Uh, it's a diagonal matrix. That makes it easy. Um, now, if I wanted to use a, uh, a gradient descent algorithm to optimize this function, I could actually compute an optimal learning rate, which would be uh, which would make it converge in a in one step, and here is how you do this. 
Okay, so let me uh, redraw, redraw the function here. So again, it's elongated. If, I, if, I, if I'm here and I take a gradient step, I'm not gonna go towards the minimum, I'm gonna go in this direction, which is orthogonal to the uh, line of uh, equal cost, okay? And uh, I'm gonna have to follow this kind of curvy trajectory to kind of, uh, in, in several steps to converge to the minimum. But I can use the trick of uh, W check equals, uh, you know, WK wherever I am here, minus uh, H minus one, the inverse of the Hessian matrix uh, times the gradient. Um, and I need to transpose this um, if I want a, a column vector. And H minus one is trivial, right? Basically that would be something like uh, one half, one, zero, zero times the gradient. Okay, and that I can compute real easily. Even if I had a neural net with 100 million dimensions, I could, I could compute this inverse super easily because it's only a diagonal matrix, right? So I don't need to store the whole matrix, I just need to store the diagonal terms. And I need to do a multiplication term by term of those, those factors by the, by the gradient. But that gives me a different learning rate for each dimension, which tells me uh, here, uh, use a learning rate in the vertical direction that is twice as large as in the horizontal direction because the curvature is too small, okay? So if I use this update formula, my, uh, my weight update here is actually gonna point directly towards the minimum. And in fact, if I use H here, if I don't use a, another learning rate, it's gonna take me directly to the minimum, okay? This is called Newton's algorithm. And what that suggests to you is that this is not a new idea, okay? <laughs> it goes back to Newton. Newton was uh, essentially trying to solve equations of the type, uh, you know, g of x, uh, I mean, g of w in our case, equals zero. Um, and he says, well, you can compute the, the, the derivative of g, and then, um, so this is like solving, you know, this is equivalent to trying to solve our problem, which is, uh, df over w equals zero, which is finding a minimum of a function. So finding a minimum of a function or finding the zeros of an equation um, is the same thing, okay? And, and Newton kind of invented that method for that purpose and he said, well, if you compute the gradient of this, which is the second derivative of that, um, and you take a step that is proportional to the inverse of that, uh, of that derivative, you, you're gonna get closer to the, um, to the minimum, uh, provided that the second derivative is positive. Okay, if it's negative, you have to do the reverse. And that's the issue with uh, uh, Newton's algorithm, which is that it really assumes that the function you're optimizing is convex. It doesn't need to be quadratic completely, but if it's non-quadratic, you're not gonna converge in one, one step, but it needs to be convex because if it's not convex, um, so here the curvature is negative, okay? right, curvature is negative, the second derivative is negative. When you multiply your gradient by the inverse of your second derivative, it's not gonna take you downhill, it's gonna take you uphill because this has a wrong sign, okay? So Newton's algorithm only works if your objective function is uh, convex, which means we can't use it for neural nets, okay? At least not in its original version. So there are all kinds of uh, ways to find uh, close approximations to the H matrix for non-convex functions that are positive uh, uh, definite. And uh, I'm just gonna flash the formula at you so that you're aware that it exists. But um, uh, in practice, it's really not, not used again for, for machine learning. Uh, so there's an algorithm called, which you, you may find in, in various packages called the levenberg markov algorithm. Uh, methods. And that method says, I'm gonna use a approximation of H, which I can guarantee is positive semi-definite. 
Okay, so it only has positive eigenvalues, which means in every direction the curvature is positive or zero. Uh, and the way you do this when you have a loss function. So when your when your loss function f of w is you know an average uh, of uh, uh, per sample loss functions. And this particular loss function is something like, say, a squared error between a target and, uh, you know, a neural net function applied to uh, an input and with a parameter. Okay, which is common. It doesn't need to be a squared error, but, you know, if it's a squared error. Um, you can approximate H as... Uh, the Jacobian matrix of G. Um, so there would be the, the, the sum over um, oh, let me let me do the let me do the full calculation because otherwise it's gonna be hard to understand. Okay, so what is H? So H, I'm gonna put one half here so I don't have to carry a two all the time. So H um, is D over uh, dw of d over dw of y minus g of xw squared. And really, this is an h for a single sample. I need to sum this over all the samples and index all the samples, OK? Uh, and I have a 1 half in front. And this, I'm making a mess. Okay, so what is the this term first? Okay, so this would be one half uh, sum over i, one one over two p sum over i. Uh, I need to divide by p here because it's an average uh, of d over dw of two whatever is in the parenthesis in the in the distance i i minus g of uh, x x i w and then times the jacobian matrix of g with respect to w okay that's the first derivative and now I need to uh, essentially uh, I can never remember where the selection oh here we go so I can duplicate I guess uh, let me go to the next page Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Anyway, um, okay, so I have H equal D over DW of um, one over P, one over two P, sum over I of YI minus G of XIW times the Jacobian matrix of G. So it's a matrix because G may be a multi, multi uh, you know, a function with multiple outputs, right? It's a neural net, right? And I need to differentiate this whole thing with respect to W again. So that's gonna be one over two P sum over I. I need to differentiate this first term here. So it's gonna be, um, so first it's gonna be YI times uh, this, this gradient, okay? And then it's gonna be G, uh, times times that. So let me let me uh, write that. So the derivative with respect to w of the product of y i by this is going to be. I mean the product of this by that. You know this is a product of two term. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to keep it uh, factorized. This is a product of two terms. So the derivative is the product. Uh, you know this is like u v, and so I need to do uh, u v prime times uh, v u prime. 
So I'm, I'm going to first differentiate uh, uh, this and then keep this constant. So the derivative of the parenthesis with respect to W uh, is uh, dg x w over dw. And I'm going to put a transpose and then product by this. And the other term is going to be y minus g of x w. times the second derivative of g with respect to w. This is an absolutely horrible object, okay? This is a fourth order tensor. Okay, it's a tensor with four dimensions. Why is that? It's because g is G is a matrix, is a, is a vector function, takes a vector, produces a vector. The Jacobian of that uh, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a matrix, okay? Because for every pair, uh, it, uh, every pair of variable, it gives you a derivative. Now you differentiate that uh, with respect to the weights again, and uh, and, and what you get uh, is um, actually, no, it's a third order tensor. Sorry about that. Um, and I need a transpose here. <clears throat> uh, so this is a horrible object. Um, it, it's non-zero if the G function is non-linear. If the G function is linear, it's zero, okay? If the error is, is small, it's also zero. So here's the trick of the Lemmerbach-Marquardt algorithm, or the so-called uh, uh, Gauss-Newton approximation. Okay, so the Gauss-Newton approximation is to say that this thing here is basically zero, like we can ignore it. Okay, so. We use an approximate Hessian that's equal to just the first term. Now, this we can compute with backprop, but it's complicated because we need a gradient for every output, okay? That gives us a matrix. Okay, but that's an n by n matrix where uh, the, the product of those two is an n by n matrix where n is uh, the dimension and it's positive semi-definite because it's basically the square of a matrix, right? It's a matrix by its transpose, so it's like a square of a matrix. It, it may, so it, it can only have positive uh, eigenvalues or so positive curvature or zero curvature if we are unlucky. But here is the trick for levin by right? Uh, we, we replace uh, H by this term. Basically the square Jacobian of our neural net function. Okay, and this was developed in a general case, not for neural nets in particular. And we add to this uh, a little constant times the uh, identity matrix. It's as simple as that. So that makes it invertible, okay? So now we have an approximation of the Hessian that is both uh, positive, uh, that is positive definite, which means it's invertible, which means we can solve a system where H is the set of coefficient, which means we can run uh, something like, you know, similar akin to the Newton algorithm. But again, this is impractical for neural nets. You could use this, for example, in the context of energy-based models to do inference of the latent variable because it's not the stochastic gradient and maybe the dimension is small enough, but, uh, uh, but we can't, we don't really use this. Um, now you can have uh, diagonal approximations of this and they would be practical. So what if you could compute the, the diagonal terms of, of, 
of uh, H tilde. Then you would have a learning rate for each dimension that would basically be more or less the, the best optimal. There are methods like this. I actually developed a method like this back 30 years ago, but, um, uh, but they're not used that much in practice. Um, instead, there are other methods that are used that I'll, I'll, go in, I'll go to in a minute. Now, let me give you also another example to give an intuition of uh, what the matrix of second derivative means. Now, if I take this little example I had before again, where, uh, let's see. Um, but then I'm kind of tilting it a little bit, okay? Now to have a function like this, I can't, I can't write the function as I wrote before, which was just, uh, you know, the function I had before just had x1 and x2. Uh, but to write this one, I have to use the product x1, x2 as well, okay? Uh, basically, you can think of this function as the same function as one we had before, except in a different reference, uh, reference frame, okay? So you can think of this function as the same as what we had before, um, which I'm going to write with different variables. So, um, so we had w1, w2 here, right? Um, let's say I'm renaming this u1, u2. In fact, let me not do this. Let me do the other way around. So this is u1, u2. And the real variable I'm observing I'm, I'm manipulating is w1, w2. So my function expressed in u1, u2, f of u, if you want, okay, is uh, uh, 2 over 2 u1 squared plus 1 over 2 u2 squared, same function I had before, okay? But if I now want to express that function in the reference frame of w, um, I need to transform the, the space of u into the space of w, okay? So I can write this as a quadratic form. This is basically um, u transpose uh, two, one, zero, zero, one half u, okay? It's a quadratic form with a diagonal uh, matrix. Uh, if I want to write this in the space of W, I need to transform, right? So to go from U to W, I basically need, there's probably a, there's a rotation matrix that turns uh, U into W. Uh, in fact, I need, the, I need the other way around. That turns W into U. And so I can write this again as one half W transpose Q transpose Two zero zero one Q W, right? Simply because this is U and this is U transpose. So I've 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 not changed the the formula. I just expressed this as a function of W now. Okay, which means in the space of W, my function no, now looks like like this W transpose. My Hessian matrix now is Q transpose. Two one zero zero Q W. It's a quadratic form, but now this matrix is not going to be diagonal anymore. Okay, the eigenvectors of that of that matrix are going to be the columns of Q. Okay, and the columns of Q are simply the the coordinates of those two U vectors in the frame of reference of W. Okay. So, uh, so here's the thing, the Hessian matrix of a quadratic function, okay, is uh, diagonal in the eigenspace of the Hessian. So you compute the matrix of second derivative, you compute its eigenvalue and eigenvectors. And when you change the frame of reference to the, this eigenspace, the, the Hessian becomes diagonal. Here I've done the opposite operation. I started from the diagonal, uh, uh, Hessian matrix, and then I expressed it in a, a space where, you know, it's rotated uh, to make it more clear, but, but basically um, that's, the, that's, in, that's the intuition. 
Um, so inverting a you know a function like this is 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 not inverting a matrix of this type is not going to be easy, and it's going to be intractable basically if W is very high dimension. Um, let me take a very concrete example. Let's say we have a bunch of data points. Okay, perhaps we want to do classification into categories. Perhaps we just want to do regression. So um, we have uh, a, a data set where the output Y is a, um, a scalar and the input is a vector. And our model is a linear model. And we want to do uh, uh, least square. Okay, so our F function is one over P, sum over I of square difference between W transpose X squared. Okay, so it's basically linear regression uh, where X is multidimensional and Y is a scalar. Uh, what is the gradient? Okay, I'm gonna put a two here. So what is the gradient? DF over DW. Okay, uh, we're gonna get two times the parentheses times the derivative of the parentheses with respect to W. Uh, the two is going to cancel that two, so we're going to get one over p, sum over i, y minus uh, w transpose x times x transpose. Okay, again, it's a row vector, right? Differentiate this again with respect to w, and we get one over p, sum over i. Uh, derivative of, uh, <clears throat> I mean, there's only one term that's gonna survive and it's W transpose X, X transpose, right? Um, and we, we differentiate this with respect to W. Um, in fact, the, the proper way to write this is D to F over DW, DW transpose, but we just write this DW squared. And what's gonna be left is, uh, X, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the indices. X I transpose. Okay, so what it tells you is that the Hessian matrix of a quadratic uh, error function when you do regression is the covariance matrix of the inputs. This is super important. Um, that actually has useful practical consequences. And why is that? What does that mean? It means that if you have, let's say, a single, a single unit, a single neuron in your, in your neural net, it's got multiple inputs. Those inputs could be real inputs or they could be outputs of other neurons, okay? What do I need to do in such a way that H is well-behaved? So basically, you know, this thing, of course, you know, there is the, the whole other neural net here, but, you know, locally, this system kind of locally optimizes its own little objective function, if you want, right? It's not quadratic or anything, but whatever it does, you know, how do we make sure that H is well behaved? We'd like H to be as close to being diagonal as possible, and we'd like all the term on the diagonal to be equal so we can use the same running rate for every weight, okay? So ideally, H should be equal to the identity, okay? Which means, what does that mean? Um, well, so H I J is equal to one over P, um, sum over K now, I have to use a different index of uh, the uh, I's input and the J's input for a sample K. Okay, so I have xi here, xj here, and the ij's term is the covariance between xi and xj. Okay. Uh, now, what I need to do now is I want my h to be the identity matrix. And so what I'd like is, uh, this term to be zero when i is different from j and to be one when i is equal to j. Uh, 
Okay, so what I'd like is HII. So I would like this to be zero. Uh, and would I like I would like this to be one. And if I do this and I minimize a squared error or something like that, uh, my uh, Hessian matrix is going to be the identity. And so I can use, you know, a learning rate, the same learning rate for all the weights. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to be in this situation where the cost function is elongated among the, the dimensions I'm considering here. So how do I do this? First of all, the first thing I need to do is subtract the mean from all the X variables. Okay, so the x's have to have zero mean because if they don't have zero mean, it's going to be really hard uh, to um, make sure there are uh, that that product is zero. Imagine that uh, x i and x j have have mean uh, ten, okay, and there is some small variation on top of this mean value of ten. This product here is going to be something like like a hundred, right? because the product of 10 by 10 averaged over, over samples. So I cannot get zero here unless my, uh, my variables have zero mean, all right? So that's lesson number one. Variables should have zero mean. The second term here is the variance of each variable, and I want them to be one. So that's lesson number two. Variable should have variance one. Okay, so how do I do this? To guarantee that the variables inside of a neural net are of zero mean and you need variance, what I can do is I can take all the variables I have, subtract the mean, and divide by the variance. Okay? And what I get at the output of this is variables that have zero mean and you need variance. And you've been using batch normalization. That's exactly what batch normalization does. Okay? So you have an explanation for batch normalization. You also have an explanation for why, when you use examples in ImageNet, the first thing you do to the images is to subtract the mean of the pixels, okay, over computed over time, uh, and again divide by the the standard deviation. Or the, in fact, you know, to a variance one, you divide by the standard deviation. You don't divide by the variance, right? Um, or standard deviation one. Uh, so that gives you kind of a, a intuitive or semi-intuitive justification for uh, you know why variables in a neural net should have zero mean and unit variance. It's so that it equalizes the the curvature of the of the cost function with respect to all the parameters in the in the system. Okay, so we've we've seen a lot of uh, things that are relatively complicated here, but those formulas are valid for uh, multi-dimensional, the multi-dimensional case is just that they're not practical because we can't we can't solve a system whose dimension is the size of our of our neural net. Uh, if you want the full theory, this is a slide from Aaron DeFazio um, that kind of talks about the convergence rate. Um, so basically, uh, you know, look at uh, so this is interesting. So let's say you are you have a quadratic error function of this form, so a quadratic form. Uh, you are computing the gradient and uh, you know that the solution uh, is obtained by basically, you know, inverting the, uh, in this particular case here, inverting the A function, which is essentially the, the A matrix, which is basically the Hessian and uh, multiplying uh, by B. Um, but we're going to use uh, gradient descent, full gradient in this case. And the question is, um, how fast is this converging? 
right? So we're going to compute WK plus one minus W star, and then we're going to replace WK plus one by its expression here, okay, inside. And we compute the gradient because we know it's AW minus B. So we get this formula here, uh, a little bit of focus focus inside, um, just, you know, rewriting uh, uh, some, some of those things. We know that W star uh, is equal to, uh, uh, you know, A minus one B. So anyway, we uh, go through a bit of uh, hocus pocus inside of this. And what we get in the end is that the distance between WK and W star, w star need to be multiplied by a factor here equal to the identity minus the learning rate times the, the Hessian. And that gives us the distance uh, from WK plus one to W star. Okay, W star being the solution. Uh, the minimum of the quadratic function. So this is what I told you before that uh, we get a exponential decay of the distance uh, between, if we use gradient descent, uh, the, the, you know, the W kind of converges towards W star uh, by kind of multiplying the distance to W star uh, by a, a factor. And that factor is, uh, is uh, I, I minus uh, the learning rate times the Hessian matrix. So if the learning rate, uh, which is scalar in this case, uh, is uh, larger than the inverse of the largest eigenvalue of A, then this term may have negative, uh, negative eigenvalues, this whole matrix. Okay, because this could be larger than the identity in some directions, and we may get divergence. Okay, uh, because this is not going to shrink anymore. If if this factor here, uh, if this entire matrix has eigenvalues that are uh, uh, larger than one, okay, or or minus one, uh, this is not going to converge. And that, that's what limits the size of the learning rate. The learning rate needs to be smaller than one over the largest eigenvalue of, of A, which is the same uh, statement I, did be, I said before, which is uh, it has to be, uh, the learning rate has to be smaller than the, essentially the largest eigenvalue of the Hessian, uh, one over the largest eigenvalue of the Hessian. Okay, the inverse, um, which is the largest curvature. Um, or twice that actually, if you want convergence, but we're gonna get oscillation if it's larger than one over the largest eigenvalue. So that gives you the, the convergence rate, which you know optimization people call linear, which to everybody else would, would mean exponential, but uh, that's what they call linear. Um, and so that gives you, uh, you know, something that says, well, the, the rate of convergence in the direction of uh, lowest eigenvalue, it's gonna be now, it's gonna take a long time. That depends on the ratio between that eigenvalue and the, your learning rate. And so overall, the, the learning speed is going to be proportional to the ratio of the uh, of one minus the ratio of the largest eigenvalue to the smallest eigenvalue, and and that's called the condition number. Uh, sorry, the, the smallest to the largest. So that's called the condition number. So you want that to be as close to to one as possible, but you can't. Okay, if your function is elongated. Uh, I just went through that. So this is just you know rewriting what I wrote in the uh, whiteboard um, that the for a quadratic error function the uh, Hessian is basically the covariance matrix of the input and I'm missing a, a factor of one half. Um, right. <coughs> So here is uh, an example. This is another example I built for a, a tutorial at, at NeurIPS many years ago, many decades ago, in fact. Um, so here's a quadratic function, which has you know, two eigenvalues. Um, the, the largest eigenvalue is 0 0.84 in this, in this particular case. Uh, if you set the learning rate to 1.5, which is a little bit smaller than uh, one over the eigenvalue, you get oscillation in the high, high curvature direction, but you get convergence in the slow convergence in the other direction. Uh, the largest uh, uh, learning rate you can use is 2.38, which is uh, um, twice, it's two over 0.84. And, and if you set it to 2.5, then you start having divergence in the direction of high curvature. You still get convergence in the direction of low curvature, but you know that's not a good idea. 
Um, so now there's something very curious about stochastic gradient descent because we use stochastic gradient descent. You know, we don't use gradient descent. So are the eigenvalues of the Hessian relevant for stochastic gradient descent? And the answer is yes, but not really in the sense that the largest learning rate now has something to do with the uh, with the, the the largest eigenvalue of the Hessian matrix, which is the largest curvature. Um, but the optimal learning rate is not just one over that value. It's something complicated that we actually don't quite know. If you want to really know everything about it, you need to read that paper by Leon Boutou and uh, uh, and Noshida and etc. Um, but there are values of the learning rate for which the convergence will be faster than you know, uh, gradient descent with the optimal learning rate. And it's because gradient descent, uh, stochastic gradient descent, uh, you know, uh, exploits the redundancy in the data. And, you know, I've explained that before. Okay, so uh, here's the thing. Uh, you need to center all the variables that enter a weight. Okay, that's the statement I just made with the whiteboard. And normalize the variances of all the variables that enter a weight. And this is a justification for a lot of the normalization tricks that people have come up with, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, now, let's take another example here. This is the simplest uh, multi-layer neural net you can imagine, okay? It's a two-layer neural net. It's got one input, scalar input, one hidden unit. Uh, in this case, with uh, uh, it's a linear uh, unit. Actually, I, I think in the diagram here, it's a sigmoid, but uh, hyperbolic tangent. Um, but in the formula here, it's linear. Uh, and then one output, okay? And what you're, you're training this neural net with a single sample, and that single sample is input equal one, output equal one. So basically you're training this very simple neural net to learn the identity function, okay? And so the loss function is very simple. It's just one, which is a desired output, minus W1 times W2, which is the product of those two weights, multiplied by the input, which is one, so I don't show it, squared, squared error, okay? That's the, that's the objective function. You can plot this in two dimensions. And you get a plot kind of like this where uh, the, solutions, the solution is a hyperbola, right? It's a hyperbola where W1 takes some value and W2 takes one over that value so that the product is one and so that this, the loss is zero. Okay, so you get uh, a hyperbolic region here. Uh, this one is not completely a hyperbola because there is a sigmoid in between, but, but this one here, there is a hyperbola on this side and one on this side where both weights are positive and both weights are negative. That is a, a solution. In the middle, you have a saddle point. So it's when both weights are zero, the, the cost is equal to one when both weights are zero. Uh, and if you move in the other direction where, you know, you, 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 you have like a positive W1 and negative W2, for example, then the cost increases like a, like a fourth degree polynomial, okay? Let's imagine that W1 is equal to minus W2 uh, then this whole thing here is like a fourth degree polynomial. And so it increases really quite really fast. Now the center point here is flat. Okay, so if you start with W1, W2 equals zero, th this thing is not gonna take off. The gradient is zero and the weights are not gonna change because the gradient is zero. This is why when you train a neural net, you need to initialize the weights to random values is to break the symmetry because if you set all the weights to zero, nothing takes off. It's a center point. Um, even with stochastic gradient, nothing, nothing takes off, okay? Uh, with sort of batch normalization, it may, you know, it, it, it may make things take off, but you need to break the symmetry, basically. You need to tell the system, okay, you know, you have equivalent choices. Um, if, I, if I have a, a neural net with multiple hidden units, I can exchange two hidden units and, you know, have them carry their weights with them. Uh, I get a different point in weight space, but I get the same input output function, right? So there are symmetries in uh, neural net architectures where you know, I can transform the, the, the weights in a particular way and not change the input output function at all. Um, so to, I need to break that symmetry to get the system into a region where you know, it has already made a choice of which weight are gonna, is gonna be positive or negative, okay? Um, in fact, there are curious phenomena, which is that uh, there's a number of papers over the last uh, couple of years on something called the lottery ticket hypothesis, which is that if you initialize a neural net uh, with uh, random weights that have the right, si the right 
uh, sign. Okay, so you know what the solution what the solution is because you trained your neural net before. Okay, and then you initialize your weights in such a way that they have the the desired sign that the solution that you obtained before uh, has, and you train your neural net. It's going to find a solution really quickly. Um, it's going to learn like incredibly quickly. If you set to zero all the weights that end up being zero um, when you train your, your network and you do a little bit of pruning, same thing, the system will basically find a solution really quickly uh, if it knows already which weight needs to be zero and what sign the, the other weights need to have, the optimization becomes super simple and trivial. So the main issue of training a neural net is to break the symmetry, is to figure out like what's, what weights are important, which ones aren't, uh, are not, and which ones, you know, which sign should each weight take, and then figuring out the optimal values once you have the, sh the ones that should be non-zero and the one that, that and which uh, sign you should have is basically trivial. Okay, um, yeah, we talked about stochastic gradient uh, optimization. Um, uh, yeah, gradient descent is the worst method in virtually all situations because uh, because it, of, of its slow and linear convergence and the fact that it's uh, you know determined by the the condition number of the of the Hessian matrix. So unless you have a separate running rate per dimension, it really doesn't work very well. But SGD works works pretty well. Um, but you have to, to take precautions and the precautions uh, we'll go to in a minute. Um, uh, so of course, HDD you know, works because on average it does gradient descent, uh, but with some noise. And the noise may be an advantage, um, certainly because uh, you, know, you exploit the redundancy in the sample. If the samples are very similar, uh, you're better off just doing more updates uh, rather than sort of refining your estimate of the gradient over a large number of samples. In fact, uh, it's, it's shown that um, if you use mini batch type training and your batch are too large, you are actually taking more time to, uh, to converge, more computation to converge. It may be faster uh, wall clock time because you can parallelize more, um, but in terms of uh, amount of computation to reach a, a particular result, it may actually be slower to use large batches. Okay. In fact, uh, the joke I make very often is that the optimal value of the batch size is one. It's almost always one. The reason we don't use one is because of the limitation of our, uh, of our hardware. Okay. So the only reason we use mini batches is because we use uh, GPUs. It's because it's easier to parallelize when you have a batch of samples uh, than not. But there is nothing fundamental about batching. Okay, so anything that is you that is based on the fact that we use batches is probably a bad idea because batches are an artifact of the hardware we're using. There is nothing principled about it. Okay, it's just the constraint of the hardware we have. Um, but if you really want to use full batch method, you should use an algorithm called limited storage BFGS or limited memory BFGS, also known as LBFGS. Okay. I do not recommend to use this for any kind of real size neural net uh, because it's a non-stochastic method. Uh, but, uh, and it also, you know, is much more expensive per iteration. But if you have a highly ill-conditioned uh, uh, function to optimize, the dimension is reasonably small, uh, then you can use uh, this LBFGS technique. It basically estimates the, the Hessian as it goes, right? It's, a, it's called, it's what's called a quasi-Newton method where you know, as the system kind of changes the weights, it estimates the inverse second derivative matrix and a kind of, uh, or a, a, a sort of a, a, a low rank version of it or kind of a compact version of it, if you want. Um, so this could be uh, useful for things like inference in an energy-based model or a graphical model, but not so much for learning. Okay, uh, practical tricks now in the 20 minutes we've left. Um, so, uh, people very often use momentum. So, what is momentum? So, momentum is basically splitting the update formula into two formula. The first one says, uh, I'm going to have a descent uh, vector, uh, I'm going to call pk plus one, and it's going to be equal to the previous descent direction multiplied by some coefficient, which I'm going to set. I can set it to zero or not, okay, to 0.9 or something. And then I'm going to add the gradient to that uh, previous descent direction, okay? Now I'm gonna use that descent direction to 
do my parameter update. And people call, call this momentum because this is kind of like uh, uh, sort of a heavy ball type, uh, you know, rolling down a, a, uh, a landscape with some friction. Th those formulas basically are equivalent to sort of, you know, simulating a ball that runs down the uh, loss surface uh, with, with inertia, but also friction. Okay. Um, if you set this beta parameter to zero, then PK plus one is just equal to the gradient and you're back to normal, uh, normal gradient, normal SGD. Uh, you now, if you write this, you know, on top of SGD, you can, you can write it this way, um, essentially, because that's the previous PK, right? That's PK. The difference between the, your, your, your current weight value and the previous one, that's PK. Uh, and you have the beta parameter here, which you can you know, set all the way up to one, and then you multiply, you add the gradient, I mean, subtract the gradient, and then update your, your weight with that. Oops. Uh, this, this beta, by the way, is not the same as that beta, okay? This is beta hat, this is beta. Uh, this one doesn't get multiplied by the learning rate. This guy gets multiplied by the learning rate. So there's a simple relationship uh, between the two. Um, that accelerates. So without momentum, you get this sort of erratic uh, oscillatory behavior in the high curvature dimension. Uh, and then, you know, it kind of goes slowly in the other direction. And this is for a given number of iteration. And with momentum here, it basically smooths out the oscillations. It doesn't reduce their amplitude. It just kind of makes them smoother. But it accelerates in the direction of, uh, of low curvature because the, the momentum kind of builds. It builds up, if you want. And so the, the ball kind of accelerates in that direction. Uh, it doesn't accelerate in the direction where it oscillates, right? But it accelerates in the direction where it doesn't oscillate. So that kind of partially correct for these issues of ill conditioning without having to do complicated things. Uh, that's the effect. So there's a, a slight issue, which is that uh, if you have large values of the beta parameter, the system tends to overshoot and, and, and does oscillate in, um, in, 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 in you know, some dimension or creates oscillations. It overshoots the, the, the solution essentially, okay. Um, so you gotta be careful about it. Um, you know, it's basically a free lunch because it's really cheap computationally in almost all situations. Um, uh, the good values of a beta parameter are between 0.9 and 0.99. Um, sometimes you get a little bit of gain by tuning it, not always the case. Uh, it certainly accelerates. Uh, there is different types of, uh, of momentum, uh, momentum methods. There's the simple one that we, we just, uh, I just explained. There's a slightly more sophisticated one that um, is called Nesterov's momentum. So Nesterov is a very famous uh, uh, scientist in, in optimization. Uh, and there, the, the first formula is identical. The second one kind of involves, uh, you know, kind of recomputing the gradient, uh, essentially, or, or like, you know, kind of looking ahead. So this is like a look ahead, right? This is like a, like a new parameter value uh, uh, and that's, you know, you, you, you basically kind of, uh, combine that with a gradient here. Um, and this, you know, can be shown to actually accelerate this, there's some theory about this, but the theory being what it is, uh, the surprising thing is that it basically doesn't work much better than regular momentum for, in the context of neural nets for mysterious reasons. Uh, so certainly momentum uh, smooths the gradient noise, uh, which is also something that batching does. Um, but but smooth, smoothing can be good or bad. Uh, uh, so, you know, here is, uh, it, it's not clear whether smoothing is good or bad. So here an, here's an example, you know, this looks like a very erratic, noisy trajectory. This looks like a much smoother one, but is this better than that? Not clear, because there is some advantage to having a noisy uh, trajectory, which is first, it might help you escape annoying areas like, like saddle points uh, faster. Um, and so it can accelerate learning actually. Um, it can improve generalization because it drives the system towards regions of the space where the minima are flatter. Um, what the system wants to minimize with stochastic uh, optimization 
is basically the average um, the average gradient uh, or, or the, the the average of the objective for all the weight values that are you know uh, uh, obtained by SGD. And if there is fluctuation, the and and the, the the cost function has a positive curvature. The fluctuations are going to cause the error function, the loss function, to actually, on average, be higher. And so this will drive the system towards region of the space where the curvature is very low, so the the minima are flatter. And for various reasons, those minima are better for generalization because if you think about the optimal value of the weight for on your training set and the optimal value of your weight on your test set, those are different values. Okay, slightly different. If you train your system on your test set, you will get a different optimal parameter, right? So you have different optimal values for the weight on the training set and the weight on the test set. Um, so if you want the weight on the training set uh, to basically, if you want the error on the test set to not be too different from the error on the training set, you want your, your loss function to be really flat. So you want to find a solution in which the, the loss is really flat, okay? Uh, and having noise in the gradient actually helps by doing this. There's even papers that say you should not use, just use the noise in SGD. You should actually add noise to the gradient to make it uh, to make the system look for flatter uh, solutions. So that's that's the point. So those things are still kind of being discussed. Like no, nobody really kind of agrees completely to all of those things. Okay. So what about automatic learning rate adjustment? So there's a, a technique, a fairly complicated technique that I came up with uh, over 30 years ago, which I'm not going to explain, that consists in estimating the diagonal terms of the Gauss-Newton approximation of the, of the Hessian matrix. Okay, so basically a diagonal levenberg marquardt approximation. And it turns out you can compute those diagonal terms of the Hessian using a backprop-like uh, formula. But those are not actually supported in the current framework like PyTorch and stuff. So that algorithm is not being used very much. Um, although some people have revived it. And so people have kind of uh, uh, tended to use simpler uh, ways to adjust the individual learning rate of each of the each of the weights, essentially each of the parameters. A separate learning rate for each parameter. Um, here is a simple idea. So as I told you earlier, um, you know, batch normalization or other things like this will normalize the variance of all the variables in your neural net. But there are variables that are not going to be normalized. So in that case, what you should do is basically modify the update rule so that the learning rate reflects the fact that your input, the corresponding input, doesn't have a unit variance, okay, or unit standard deviation. Uh, and this trick here consists in basically dividing the gradient for a particular weight, okay, one particular weight. Um, you divide it by the standard deviation of the gradient. Okay, this is for one particular weight. Okay, uh, the index has been dropped, but this is for one particular weight. Uh, so you divide by the the standard deviation uh, of the of the you know running average of the gradient uh, squared. Okay, and that's like an estimate of the gradient. It's an estimate of. Okay, I take back what I said earlier. This is the the uh, a running average estimate of the square of the gradient. And the square of the gradient is a, a kind of a substitute for the corresponding diagonal term of the Hessian. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's sort of an, a, an approximation to it, all right? And so this is a bit like dividing by uh, kind of the diagonal Hessian. Uh, strangely enough, there's a square root. I would not put a square root here, but RMS prop puts a square root and why not? This epsilon uh, factor here is there to prevent this thing from blowing up if the variance is very small, if the variance of the gradient is very small. Uh, there's a, a much more complicated version of this called uh, natural gradient where the, you use the, the square covariance matrix of the gradient instead of doing it independently for each, uh, for each uh, component. It's a good trick, um, but that's, a better trick, so uh, ADAM is a very popular method and it's basically RMS prop combined with a kind of momentum. Okay, so it's got a momentum on the gradient, a momentum formula on the gradient and a running average momentum formula if you want. I mean, it's just a running average uh, on the square of the gradient. And then your update is uh, the, the momentum, momentumized gradient divided by the, the square root of the running average of the square gradient. Uh, and this is again, separately done for each dimension. 
okay, for each each learning rate. Um, so it's basically RMS prop with momentum. Uh, so here's how it works when you compare all those methods. SGD, you know, kind of fluctuates a lot. RMS prop uh, still fluctuates a lot, but sort of corrects, you know, gives you kind of a straighter uh, direction towards the, the minimum. And then Adam, you know, includes some momentum. So it kind of, you know, overshoots a little bit, but then converges towards the minimum a little faster. Um, so, you know, poorly conditioned problems, which, you know, <laughs> might occur depending on your architecture. Adam is often much better than SGD, uh, pure SGD. Uh, and, and, you know, it's better than RMS prop because of the momentum term. Um, it's very poorly understood theoretically, and it has some disadvantages. Um, there are some cases where it doesn't converge. It gives worse generalization error sometimes. This is something really annoying, but like good optimization methods sometimes result in uh, worse uh, generalization error. Uh, it requires a little bit more memory, but that's not a big issue. Um, and, and you need some more tuning because there's two uh, hyperparameters, essentially. So that requires a bit of uh, adjustment. Okay, lastly, I wanna talk about normalization techniques. Um, so you've been using batch norm and things of that type. And basically those are designed to, uh, you know, cancel the mean and uh, normalize the variance or standard deviation of all the variables in your, in your network. Very often uh, those batch norm or normalization layers, whatever they are, are inserted between linear layers and activation functions. Uh, and, but you could have an argument that normalization layers should actually be placed after the activation function just as well. In fact, you could have both. Uh, so the reason for, uh, for having it before is that uh, you, you, you want the activation function, if it's a ReLU, for example, you want the ReLU to roughly be uh, on half the time and off half the time. And the best way to do this is to cancel the mean of whatever variable enters uh, the ReLU. Okay, subtract the mean, essentially. You could normalize the variance as well, but it's not very useful because a ReLU is equivalent to contrast in, uh, anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, but then uh, after that, the next layer up is probably gonna be another linear layer. And that linear layer has weights and those weights really want their inputs to have zero mean and be, uh, uh, and be uncorrelated as much as possible, which means, you know, a zero mean and, and, and you need variance and also be decorrelated. Uh, decorrelation, we don't really know how to do, but uh, I mean, we know how to do it, but it's too expensive. Uh, but certainly subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation is something we can do. So we can have a normalization layer right after the activation function. And it's very disputed, you know, where you should put them and, you know, what's the optimal thing to do. Truthfully though, most people put it just before the activation function and they don't put it afterwards. Uh, now, if you have a ReLU, the ReLU is not gonna produce zero mean outputs. And to me, it hurts. Like I, I think it's horrible, but that's what people do. So here's a trick for uh, normalization layers. You take an activation, you subtract some constant, normally it's the estimate of the mean of the activation. So it could be a mean over uh, of that particular variable over time. It could be over time, but just over this mini batch or over a longer time uh, with a running average, for example, or it could be a mean computed over the whole layer, not over time, but over the layer. Uh, or it could be over uh, a feature map of a convolutional net or multiple feature maps uh, or over channels, but not over uh, space. Okay, so that's uh, the mean cancellation. Then you divide by the standard deviation of the, of the activation computed before, okay? And then you have two learnable parameters, which are basically a scaling factor and a, a bias, okay? And that's before you feed that to the ReLU. That's the standard normalization layer. Um, <clears throat> and you need those two things if you want the system to be able to sort of, you know, change the average activation of the ReLU and, and et cetera. I'm not sure this one is particularly useful actually. Uh, so, yeah, this is for like a bit of a detail for batch norm, but let me show it here. So batch norm, 
So here's a 3D tensor uh, where actually two of the dimensions have been collapsed, the spatial location for a convolutional net. Okay, so you have HW, which are the spatial location for a 2D convolutional net, for example, the channel or, or feature index uh, direction here, and then the instance in the batch in that dimension. And batch normalization says um, you, 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 you compute the mean of uh, uh, a feature map, so you have a single mean for all the variables in a feature map, right? So you sum over space and you sum over batch, okay? And you get a single value for each feature map, okay? You subtract that, you compute the standard deviation or the variance, uh, the same, and then divide by the standard deviation, okay? And again, that's a single value per feature map uh, in your convolutional net. Uh, and that's batch norm for, for convolutional layers, essentially. But there are other proposals, uh, layer norm. So a layer norm averages over space and channel, but not over time, okay? Instance norm averages over space, but neither over time nor over channel. And group norm averages over channels, but only a small number of channels, not the entire thing, okay? Now, why use all those different things, you know? I I'm a little uneasy about batch norm, even though it's very popular, because, you know, again, as I said, batch is sort of an artificial result of the hardware constraints of our, of our systems. Why should we average over a batch? Like, why would that, why would the size of the batch that just happens to be the right thing for a GPU be also the size of the batch that we use for the, uh, for the normalization? There's no reason for it at all, other than convenience, okay? There's no deep reason for it. It's just convenient. Um, in fact, it might be better to do this over, like do a running average over, over multiple uh, batches or maybe a, a subset of a batch, but it's not as easy, so people don't do it. They just do this because it's simple. Uh, same for those, they are simple, but the fewer variables you use in your, in your normalization, the more chances you have of things kind of going south or blowing up or not doing the right thing. Um, so, you know, normalization help for the intuitive reason I explained earlier that you want your Hessian matrix, you know, the local Hessian matrix for a given unit to be close to the uh, identity essentially. Uh, but like, you know, multi-layer net, why really does it help? It's, it's still disputed. There's been paper on this since the 19, 1980s. Um, you know, I, I had some papers on this in the 1980s. There were a few papers in the 1990s. Then neural net became not so popular. So nobody actually wrote about this and then it became Really interesting again, you know, when deep learning started to emerge, you know, around 2014 or so, um, uh, where people came up with all those Adam and there's another one called Lars, which is a, another uh, variation. Uh, but the theory behind this is, is, is very disputed. Uh, in practice, you know, some things work in some cases, not all. Uh, so not clear. <clears throat> Uh, basically, normalization, yeah, allows you to be sort of, you know, it gives you peace of mind. It allows you to be more careless about how you kind of build your neural net. You know, you don't have to think about it too much. How you scale your values, etc. Uh, there are there are some theoretical studies, and I'll uh, end here on the number of uh, saddle points. Uh, I, mean, I mean, there's a lot of very interesting theoretical studies about the complexity of the of the lost surface of deep uh, deep learning systems and the complexity of the functions that uh, deep architectures can approximate. Uh, I'm not going to go into that, but uh, just to tell you that there are uh, various papers that say that the number of uh, saddle points uh, that are present in the objective function is very large, combinatorially large, actually. Uh, but there don't seem to be a problem. Uh, not too much of a problem in the sense that, you know, you kind of escape the, as, as long as you don't get too close to them, uh, SGD will, you know, find a, find a good solution. There are two questions um, here though about yes, this. Go ahead. Why is SGD preferred in SSL tasks? Uh, well, SGD is preferred whenever the objective function you're minimizing is an average over many samples. And SSL is just an example of that. Okay, and then there is one more question. There was a recent paper from OpenAI and DeepMind, or DeepMind, 
uh, aimed at the uh, challenging the use of batch normalization. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's part of this of this thing that I was just saying that uh, a lot of the results are, are disputed, and the reason for those methods to work is disputed. There is some, into, you know, semi theoretical intuitive arguments for why they work. There's no proof or anything. Um, it's just experimentally they work in certain cases, but sometimes they don't, and we don't really know why. Uh, there is this uh, issue that I mentioned that uh, the methods that tend to be fast also tend to not to produce. Uh, generalization that is not actually as good, strangely. Uh, uh, you know, things that, you know, techniques that reduce noise like momentum, you know, may accelerate, but in the end, maybe they cause the system to find worse solutions because, um, because the noise helps regularizing the, the system. Uh, you know, for when we regularize neural nets, right, we, we can add noise to the weights. What people do is they add noise to the states, to the to activations, right? This is what dropout does. Uh, dropout basically uh, you know, suppresses some of the activations of some of the uh, some of the units in the layer. Uh, that basically makes the system more noisy, but it helps, right? There are other semi-theoretical arguments for that. Uh, so a lot of those things are interacting. The dynamics are very complicated, and we don't understand all of it. You know, these techniques are used for learning, right? Whenever we train our models, so we that we have that the objective function is this average of. Uh, per sample loss functionals. Uh, but then also we use, again, the scent for the minimization of the energy to do inference, right? In those cases, we use different algorithms. Yeah, so uh, when you're doing inference in an energy-based model, you are, you're, you're finding the minimum of a function, which is just the energy function for this one sample you're considering. And this is not a sum or an average of many terms that are almost identical, right? So just remember yeah. this, right? You only want to use stochastic uh, methods when your objective function is a sum of many, many terms, many of which are very similar to each other. Uh, and SGD will exploit the redundancy between the samples. Um, I think I've used that example before in a preceding lecture, but I'll use it again. Imagine I give you a training set, it's got 1 million training samples, but in fact, it's uh, 10,000 repetitions of the same 100 samples, okay? If you use batch gradient, you're gonna compute the average of the gradient over the 1 million samples. And without noticing, you're going to do 10,000 times more work than necessary because you could have obtained the same estimate with only 100 samples, okay? Uh, but you didn't realize it. Now, if you use HDD, by the time you've computed 1 million gradients, you've actually done 10,000 iterations over those 100 samples, okay? So it goes 10,000 times faster. I mean, this is not just, you know, two times faster, it's 10,000 times, right? Now, of course, in reality, in a training set, you never have samples that exactly replicate. Uh, but you do have samples that are very similar, right? You do data augmentation, you have a whole bunch of samples that are basically all the same with some slight variation. Uh, two examples of number one in MNIST, you know, are very, very similar. And by the time you get to the top layer of the of ComNet, they're basically identical. So, um, so you need to use SGD to exploit that redundancy. This is something that, you know, it took, you know, Leon Boutou, uh, myself and a bunch of others about 15 years to convince the machine learning community that the three lines of SGD was more efficient than the super complicated optimization algorithm they were using for super vector machines and whatever. Um, uh, but, but it's true. Uh, but on the other case, if we are doing, let's say, optimal control, where we have one vector yes. uh, of actions for a given uh, well-defined uh, cost, then instead you're going to be using other types of algorithms. Okay, right. So if you have a function to optimize and the function is not an average over lots of samples, there's no redundancy to exploit, uh, and that function may, you know, maybe convex or non-convex, maybe probably non-quadratic. You want to use an optimization method which is not stochastic and basically takes advantage of the, the second order properties, uh, you know, kind of estimates the, the inverse Hessian as it goes and stuff like that, right? So if the dimension of the variable you're optimizing is, is, is large, say more than 100 or something, you don't want to use any sort of order and cube methods like, like uh, levin Marquardt or anything like that, because it's going to be too slow, or BFGS, which is uh, another method that, um, uh, that, that does this. What you can use is, uh, okay, so BFGS is a so-called quasi-Newton method that estimates the inverse Hessian as the algorithm proceeds. Um, 
you know, you know, basically by computing the the difference between gradients at different places, it can it can update a, a matrix that is an estimate of the inverse gradient. That's called quasi-Newton methods. So BFGS is at one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum is something called conjugate gradient, which is very efficient. Mm -hmm. It's an order n algorithm, so there's no matrices in it. It's just uh, uh, vectors that you compute dot products of, uh, but it exploits the the, the, the sort of second order properties of the uh, of the objective function. Uh, it requires a line search between uh, different uh, search directions. Um, but it's, it's you know it's implemented in in NumPy or SciPy. You know you can you can just use it. Um, in between there is something called LBFGS, which means limited memory BFGS, which is an invention by Jorge Nocidal, the co-author with Leon Boutou of this uh, big paper on SGD. Um, it's not a, a stochastic method. It's designed for a full gradient. Um, uh, and it's basically intermediate between BFGS and conjugate gradient. The L, there's a parameter that, that controls the basically the, the rank of the matrix, not really the rank, but the, the complexity of the matrix that you use as your approximation to the Hessian. That parameter is equal to N when you use BFGS, or it's equal to one when you use uh, conjugate gradient. It's you know, equal you set it to three or four, you have limited storage BFGS, it's mm -hmm. only a little bit more expensive than conjugate gradient, but you know it might it might help the speed of convergence. So it's something you might want to use. I would start with conjugate gradient and, and then maybe use LBFGS. Cool. Awesome. And so this was the end of the class for today, I think. All right. All right. Thank you again, for everyone, for Sorry. joining. Uh, we see you tomorrow for learning the track backer upper controller and policy uh, controller and emulator. All right. Bye bye, everyone. All right. Take care, everyone.